I like to tell people that juggling is about cultivating a relationship with an object. So it's about understanding how something moves, understanding what something is, understanding what the possibilities are with something. Juggling has a somewhat loose definition when you start to break down what is juggling. My definition of juggling is frequently manipulating an object with intent for an audience. That could be many, many things across all of history. The first thing people think of when I tell them I juggle is do 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 Great, that's awesome, yes. That is in a lot of things and we use it a lot for stuff. Um, avoid the J word, just call yourself a variety entertainer. <laughs> but that when you tell someone I'm a juggler, they say, do a trick for me, entertain us. Can you perform at a birthday party? Yeah, they don't, they don't go up to a ballet dancer and ask like, oh, well, can you do the nutcracker? That's not a thing. No one does that. <laughs> The circus arts are an accessible form of performance-based entertainment, but that's gotten it labeled as low culture or tricks for claps. For example, parents generally don't push their children to become professional clowns, contortionists, jugglers. And that's a whole conversation about the role that art plays in modern society. In an effort to accurately represent what the circus arts are all about, I've talked at length to hobbyists and professionals. These are the stories, ideas, and inner thoughts of the circus artists of today. There's always a healthy dose of skepticism from anybody that loves you when you're first starting out on something that is as, uh, uh, I don't know, as fragile as a career in the performing arts, you know? There was no tiptoeing into this. It was you had to, you had to commit to being this person. If you're going to be an artist, go all in. My first street show that I ever did, I gave all of the money that I made back to the people that gave it to me. Like I was so embarrassed about what it was that I had put on, I guess, put on the street corner. <laughs> the thing that I had, I had requested everybody watch me do. Lots of people would say they appreciate and value circus artists or artists, but then there's a breakdown where you're like, but it's really hard to be an artist uh, financially unless you're in movies or, or something else or you're at the top. As you become more successful, people start to understand what it is that you're trying to do and that, yeah, you're not just screwing around and, you know, juggling on a street corner. You actually have, you know, bigger thoughts about how you play into uh, how you play into the society that you live in. And I, I would say that most of the performers that I that I know, respect, look up to, um, they also have thoughts about that. You know, it's it's wonderful to be able to come up with you know a fun gag with a coat hanger or something. No wine. No wine. No wine. No wine. No wine. Oh my goodness, a rubber lobster. Wine. But it's it's another thing to uh, understand what it is that you're actually doing, as somebody that views what they're doing as a legitimate art form. Tom Wall is a professional variety artist, and he's written at length about juggling and its history. He's the founder of Modern Vaudeville Press, a publishing company specializing in books about the circus and variety arts. The, the super accelerated brief version of why circus is where it is now is that Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey was bigger than Hollywood in terms of revenue for the longest time. It was massive. The Great Depression hits and we have the Works Progress Administration, right? So this is long before the, uh, the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, exists. And as part of the WPA, you know, they, they dumped money into arts, they dumped money into architecture, they dumped money into all of these beautiful public works. Um, but circus was, cons uh, was seen as such a popular entertainment thing. It was more or less seen as without the... Uh, sort of like, you know, the moral underpinnings that you would see within opera or, you know, legitimate theater performances and that kind of thing. So we were, we were categorized purely as entertainment, something without any moral substance. And that carried through all the way to the NEA. So like, if you're a circus company that's, that's trying to, you know, get grant funding today, you have to categorize yourself as either theater or dance. There's no subheading for, you know, circus. Um, you compare that to other countries, you know, like France, for example, not only do they have a subheading for circus, 
they dog ear certain amounts of money for trapeze, certain amounts of money for juggling. You know, it's it's considered part of the actual cultural life of their, you know, of their nation, of their country, of their culture. There are opportunities out there for artists that I haven't used, partly because I thought, for example, grants in Iowa, I never really thought as a circus artist that would be something available to me until recently. And then I applied and I got one and I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Also, it feels like it's advancing circus as an art form for more people because it's not always thought that way. And everyone knows Cirque du Soleil and like Barnum and Bailey's, but not that many people in general in the U.S. have gone and seen like a four-person small contemporary circus show where they're doing like theater and music and juggling and storytelling and all kinds of things. And in Europe in general, there's been a tradition of that for not only is like the traditional circus tradition just so deep and long, there's a lot more of like, there's a huge tradition of just street festivals that doesn't exist in the US much, there's a few. In France, like every single small town, exaggeration a bit, but it, you really feel like, oh wow, there's like a street festival where people expect like really interesting things like uh, circus or music or just various forms of art. And, the, and here in the US, it's often more just like art festivals or county fair style. And there's not really like as much of an expansive, like we're gonna make the streets come alive and there'll be like circus shows until four in the morning and, and, and all this stuff. The audience in the US can be inc incredible and even more appreciative sometimes because they haven't seen it. So if they have a chance, I've had some of the biggest crowds I've ever had anywhere I've performed in the world at the Des Moines Farmers Market. And it's like, it's kind of a boon to be able to be the only one <laughs> doing it. Having circus arts recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts would be huge in this country. There would be funding for schooling for people who want to go. We wouldn't have people from the U.S. who are talented circus artists going to other countries to go to school and then maybe not coming back because there's also not as rich of a work environment, right? If they want to fund their own show, it's hard for them to get a grant to do that here in the U.S. And so that that's kind of where circus arts lies is there isn't a category for it. And so it falls into interdisciplinary, <laughs> which means so, so many things. And as panelists and people are reviewing that, it's up to their interpretation. And if they, if their only experience of circus is from a cartoon or a book they've read, they've never gone to a circus, they've never seen juggling, they've never seen an aerial act, they're using their best guess and their best knowledge and experience. Whereas ballet, opera, orchestras, people have been more exposed to that. And, and part of that is because of that funding. You know, like every single culture has some idea of a performer. I'm using the word performer just meaning somebody that goes in front of other people to share something. Um, you know, you see that in Native American cultures, you see that in African cultures, you see that literally everywhere around the world. Some, you know, some person whose job it is to, uh, uh, to sort of embody the human experience as it is understood by that culture. Um, same thing happens with juggling, you know, uh, Native American cultures use juggling as a, as a game. They used it as gambling. You look in Japan and it was a, it was a religious thing. You know, there are roots of juggling 4,000 years ago um, in ancient Egypt in the Middle Kingdom. Um, it's probably older than that as well. You know, those are just sort of the oldest uh, material artifacts that we have that represent juggling. So this is an ancient Greek lekythos that has an image of a woman juggling three balls on it. Absolutely incredible. So this is from about the year 500 BC. More modern and traditional styles of what people see as juggling are somewhat reversed. There is an idea that 
maybe street performing is something that's like really new and fresh. Uh, but re in reality, the idea of gathering a crowd and talking to people and performing for them is one of the oldest traditions in humanity. Every culture has done this. Every culture has had a reason to do this. Um, same thing with contortion, same thing with acrobatics. What we understand as circus is, uh, it was really this one guy that decided to start putting together this, uh, this bit of pageantry that involved all of these different acrobatic disciplines. I would say something that's more modern is the idea of things like uh, Cirque du Soleil, where they have these big productions, big lighting, uh, these huge shows that are meant to be kind of theatrical dance style shows. Now, combining those things with juggling is not new, but the way that they do it would be a newer style. Whereas, you know, to me, a more traditional sense of performing as a juggler or just performing as an entertainer would be something like street performing. And then somewhere in the middle there, you have traveling circuses. You have like traditional style circus shows where it may be in a ring or the things that people associate with like animals in the shows and you know going and seeing clowns and things like that. Working as an artist for a large production company has its unique set of challenges. Wall toured with Cirque du Soleil's show Totem for a number of years. You know what is what is your MO? Why are you there? Is to do something that's novel, do something that people haven't seen before um, and it's pretty hard to separate that understanding from having a job where you do the same thing again and again and again. So when you first start out in a company like Cirque du Soleil, your sort of your raison d'etre or whatever is learning how to do the act as perfectly and as consistently as you possibly can. So when I was performing for Cirque du Soleil, I was doing Greg Kennedy's cone juggling act, uh, an act called Conic. You know, you're standing inside of this inverted plexiglass uh, cone and rolling balls on the inside surface. So they whip around you like atoms inside of a, a molecule or electrons in an atom. And uh, then you sort of reach a point where you've, you feel like you've explored every tiny nuance that you possibly have within that. And then from there, the love affair starts to kind of disappear because you feel like you understand it completely you know, we're talking about having done the show, you know, the same act on stage in front of people over a thousand times. You know, you've, you've been doing it for years and years and years, several times a day. You know, zooming out and sort of trying to figure out what it is that you're actually doing. Am I just entertaining the upper middle class of the world or am I trying to do something bigger than that? You know, what, what is, am I still an artist? Am I just a tradesman? Am I, am I just a craftsman who's you know, doing this physical skill again and again and doing it well enough to get paid every day. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that probably sums up, you know, the issues that I had with Soleil, you know, and, and also realizing that you're not surrounded by variety people. You're not surrounded by people that, uh, that understand the world in the same way that you do. You know, your, your immediate boss, even though they're called artistic director, they're a bureaucrat. You know, their whole job is to report back to the headquarters in Montreal and, uh, and talk about, you know, did you drop? Yes or no. It has nothing to do with how the audience felt. It has to do with the technical execution of the thing. Um, and sort of uh, as a result of all of those feelings, that's why I ended up leaving the company at the beginning of 2019 to start performing my own show on cruise ships. You know, even though cruise ships, that's not really a place where you see a lot of high art, you know, art with a capital A, at least it was a place where my voice could be heard. Yeah, I think the idea is that here in the States, we've shoehorned juggling into such a little box. Uh, and that's probably our fault as jugglers back in the day. Uh, we sold ourselves this way because that's where the money was. But what we're really looking for nowadays as a society is growth. And we're realizing that there are some very basic human instincts that we have overlooked. We've turned it into a commodity and we've gotten so good at selling it that we've, that we have just like, weakened its potential for ourselves as human beings and uh i'm not trying to say like who capitalism but when we focus on things as products we start to forget 
like what it means to exist as a human and and as a society as a juggling community we are aware of the benefits of juggling we feel good we feel confident we connect with the community and we want to share and we want to learn and we want to teach uh, and these are all such wonderful like basic human needs you mentioned that you were with Soleil for a number of years. How do you maintain relationships and like with your family and friends during that time? Is it difficult? I'd say uh, maintaining a relationship while you're on the road is is extremely difficult for sure. Um, you know, just trying to get mail, something as simple as trying to get a package delivered can be near impossible. You know, you're only in a town like thinking about Soleil, you're only in a town for at most as an outlier, six months at a stretch. Six months, that's Tokyo. That's the only city in the world where a Soleil show will stay for that long. So usually you're in the same city for eight to 10 weeks, maybe 12 if you're lucky. Um, and so, yeah, you're a moving target and you've got one day off every week. So if you're trying to to maintain a relationship that's kind of what that one day of the week is spent doing um you know going off on a date going you know assuming that your partner is in town there with you otherwise it's just a whole lot of skype it's a whole lot of zoom it's uh yeah it's it's less of a job and more of a lifestyle um for sure sure so you've reached um a point in your career where you have you know your thumbs in all these different pies right but let's take it back to 2009 kind of starting out and what are some difficulties that you faced i mean i was i was living in my car for a little while um you know the uh so so something that's always stuck with me um is a bit of advice that i got from a traditional american clown a guy that you know went to the ringling clown college back when that was a thing um and they told me that the secret to being a good clown is that you have to have 10 years of ballet followed by 10 years of hard drug use. And it's important to do it in that order. But yeah, I mean, that that's like a really cynical kind of dark way of looking at it. Um, but the idea there is that you have to have some kind of technical ability, and then you have to understand something about the human condition. And after that, you can actually have a meaningful career where you impact people. And I'm not saying that, you know, like, oh, poor little old me living in my car for, you know, for a year or eight months or whatever it was. Um, I'm not I'm not saying that's the same as, you know, traumatic drug use. <laughs> um, but you really you have to see some amount of hardship in order to in order to really do your job effectively. And uh, and yeah, so, I mean, I, I would say that I saw a lot of that firsthand, you know, people that say, oh, you want to be a professional juggler, like enjoy living in your parents basement and you know while i while i have certainly lived in my parents basement i'm also talking to you from a house that i paid for with my juggle money you know um and so i would say some of the hardships you know like we're talking about self-doubt there's a lot of self-doubt there's always self-doubt if you're not doubting yourself i wonder about your mental stability maybe you know is, you know, the, the whole time, you know, when you're in university or an undergrad, you know, people are telling you that you need to, you need to go get a real job, you need to, you know, work in a, in an investment bank or something. And yeah, you're rolling your eyes appropriately. So, um, and, uh, and yeah, discount everything that you love, things that you love, that's, that's your hobby. Um, and, you know, I'm either lucky or unlucky in that something that historically has been my hobby is now my career. Um, and has that changed my relationship with juggling? Absolutely. You know, I, I don't necessarily practice for fun so much. I, I'm spending my time reading books and learning more about the industry and that, you know, it certainly changes a lot of your understanding. But without having grown up as a hobby juggler that was just interested in the technique and tricks for the sake of tricks. Um, I don't know that I would have the, uh, the depth of understanding that I rely on in my day-to-day -day life with, you know, with, uh, with the avenues that I'm pursuing now. Yeah, I've done a lot of shows in the circus in, on the stage. We've been to international festivals. We've been around Europe a bit. Uh, so I could 
just pick up a lot of experience from a really young age because there were older performers who just took me with them, which was really nice for me. Um, yeah, and then yeah, I started, I think, when I was 11 or 12. That's when I s learned juggling. But in a circus, you kind of try out a lot of stuff and a lot of different things you do on stage. And then I've been to my first juggling convention in 2017, and then that's what I, when it's really hit me. And I've got insanely addicted to it. I've met uh, crazy jugglers I've just seen online. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much when I started to take juggling pretty serious. And when it switched from a hobby to kind of a future profession or dream. And now I'm kind of between studying in university and uh, and performing, so that's where we kind of want to find a balance between. We just finished high school, so yeah, now is the time to just try out stuff for the future. Independent circus artists are essentially small business owners. I talked with International Jugglers Association treasurer Afton Benson about helping artists on the administrative side of things. I work with Benjamin Domas Grew and Modern Vaudeville Press and Tom Wall. Richard Kennison is a juggling coach. I work with Bindlestiff Family Circus in New York City. And for those, I do a variety of things. I do bookkeeping. I assist with travel plans, negotiating contracts, making sure they get paid, all that jazz. And she was the one who was like, hey, you have to think about taxes. You have to think about quarterly payments. You have to think about like longevity terms, like what gigs are you going to take to grow artistically? And what gigs are you going to take to grow financially. When I was younger, my ideals were set pretty high. I'm only going to take a gig that fulfills one of my four requirements. I had I had written out like a little list that I would weigh each with each request against. Does it help me grow artistically? Does it help me learn something new? Does it take me to a new interesting place I've never been? And I can't remember the fourth one now. But then Afton came along and said, you should add a fifth one. Does it help you fiscally to take this gig so that you can do the artistic work later on. If I get offered a really well-paying corporate job, there's always a resistance in me because i that's not what I would want to do all the time. But then it's like, OK, I can do this once for this corporation where they might often I do you do a corporate show and it's like feels like it's just their party and they're like, we're going to pay this guy really well to do this, but then there's like two people watching and they're just having their employee party and it feels like someone just checked a box on like bring the performer to the event or something. And that feels like in a lot of ways uh, the most meaningless thing I could be doing with my art. But then when I remember I didn't invent this system and I can take that money and use that as uh, funding for this or just know that I'm set for a week. But yeah, making money, it's uh, it's it's mostly about going out, doing a show, understanding what the situation you're being put in is. You know, if I'm doing a wine festival and I'm just there to, you know, juggle wine glasses and wine bottles and things and make people laugh, that's great. I'll take that money that I made and put it back into the publishing company and, and try and, you know, turn the flywheel that way. You have to start thinking about what you do as a tool um, to accomplish something else. Because beyond that, it's just uh, it's just tricks for claps, and that's not really a fulfilling place to be. When I first started juggling and realized I could street perform, I did that for a few years, sort of nonstop, all over all over the world. Because once I realized, oh, I could just go somewhere and street perform, then I'm like, I can. It's basically like I can work anywhere I want. Uh, had a beautiful few years like that. 
it was also really crazy. And but I was kind of really kind of obsessed with the idea that uh, kind of anti-capitalist way of living in that way, which was kind of the ideal way. Like I'm only getting paid from people that appreciate my work. So it's kind of like it's me and the audience and that's it. And there's that's like super beautiful romantic idea of things, which I still operate in that mode sometimes of performing, street performing that way. But eventually just had to realize like this is so unreliable. I can't live this way and do and advance also myself or in my art or do other kinds of shows. So I just got offered, the, or applied for, and then got offered the juggling and movement instructor position at Circadian School of Contemporary Circus in Philadelphia. One of my specialties, I feel like, is juggling and, and movement and dance. Uh, I was really excited because it was an opportunity to go deeper and share what I do. To be in a circus space, everyone's just working on things there, so it feels like a wonderful laboratory. For 75 years, jugglers from across the globe have gathered at International Jugglers Association's festivals. In 2022, that festival was held in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's our first time in America, also first time at the IJA Juggling Convention and I guess uh, the coolest thing here is uh, seeing all the jugglers who we've always watched on YouTube in the last years yeah. who've motivated us and just uh, talking to them and practice with them. For me it was like Spencer and Rolly, uh, Jack Danger, Albert Lucas, Lursal, or Jonah about the Greenhouse, uh, those yeah. were like Probably yeah. our main inspirations yeah. from America. Yeah, we've yeah. watched them on, on YouTube for years, and now it's the first time meeting them in person, which is a crazy experience and kind of a dream coming true. So YouTube changed everything for juggling. I, I learned how to juggle long before YouTube, long before there was any kind of online streaming anything. Um, there used to be an online repository where you could download video files from like an FTP server, you know, they were all juggling or variety or circus related. Um, but, you know, I, there was never any way that you could just Google, you know, how to juggle five balls and find, you know, a hundred different, you know, videos or articles or anything about it. So yeah, historically juggling has only ever existed as the juggling happened, now that we can capture things like this on video, on film, you know, in photographs, um, that's changed everything. And uh, you saw a little bit of that happen sort of around the turn of the century when motion pictures turned into a thing. But with the advent of streaming video, streaming technology, things like Zoom, how we're talking right now, um, that's, that's really changed everything about this particular type of performing art. There's a really great community in the circus variety arts world. Everyone is super eager to teach you something. Like this week is summer camp for a bunch of people with a rather uh, esoteric hobby or profession. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Modern Vaudeville Press began making Russian-style juggling balls. They placed how-to-juggle kits in little free libraries across Philadelphia. And slowly that's grown into a program where every time we sell a book, we donate uh, one of these sets of balls. So like, you know, they only cost like 75 cents a dollar or whatever to make. Um, and yeah, so every, every book that we sell, the first dollar of revenue that comes from that goes straight into making another set of these balls. And, uh, and we donate them, you know, wherever, to a little free library. We've done work with uh, 
with actual libraries, you know, municipal libraries. Um, since we started here in Philly, it's grown to, so Philadelphia, New York, Minneapolis, Washington, DC, there's a group in Ireland that's doing the same thing. Um, you know, we, we have a PDF of the instructional sheet online that people can download for free. So if they want to get involved and do a similar thing for, you know, for their community, they're more than welcome to. Just like, uh, like I was just talking with someone and like juggling changed their life and they are so grateful for that. And like everything that, that it's given to them, that this, it's a very similar idea that I think a lot of people feel. Juggling has given us so much. And so there's just this natural reaction to sort of give it back and to pay it forward. Like we wouldn't be here without the people who let us like stand on their shoulders. And we're just, that's our job is to keep lifting the next people up. Whenever there's an opportunity to teach juggling, to share the ideas and to encourage play and growth and joy, like that's, I think that's, I think that's what you're feeling. That's what you are like, no, there's something here. Yeah, it's it's called, called, I don't know, it's called life. There's life in this little sub-community, subculture. And I don't know, it's pretty, pretty tantalizing if you ask me.